Mark is a printmaker who comes at his craft through a love of drawing. If you Google him, you will likely find a picture of him standing in front of a print engine, some sort of monster out of the 19th <laughs> century, if you know what I mean. Um, in some of the pictures, he holds a large club. And he tells me it's not for hitting students. It's actually a roller for putting the ink on, on the machine. Uh, Mark's work has sort of a spare quality. Uh, he uh, is influenced a lot by Asian ideas of art and, and an aesthetic sense there. So you'll get a sense of what he's doing as he um, uh, talks to you today. Um, just to give you the usual sort of academic vita, uh, he earned a BFA, Bachelor's of Fine Arts from Kansas University in 1986, and an MFA from Indiana University in 1990, and was hired at UW in 1995, and he now holds the rank of full professor there. He first began exhibiting in national exhibitions in 1987, and the first of his many solo exhibitions was in 1988. His work often appears uh, both in America and abroad now in more than six shows a year. After arriving in Wyoming, his work began showing up at Western regional shows, New Mexico, Montana, Utah, South Dakota, Colorado. Wyoming has seen a lot of his work uh, with appearances in Cody, Casper, Cheyenne, several appearances here uh, and, and uh, here in Jackson, even here in the museum and so on. And then just when you think you know a guy, his work began getting international attention, appearing in Australia, New Zealand, and the Javaskalaya Art Museum in Finland. His work was shown in an exhibit on rural US artists called Art in Isolation uh, that traveled from Kolbath, Norway, finally to the Nicolaisen uh, Museum in Casper. Uh, in 2003, he served as an artist in residence at Kritranik Ketan in India, which led to participation in exhibits in Trivandrum, Goa, West Bengal, and Haryana, India. He now regularly leads student trips to India. Along the way, he has managed to win nearly every teaching award at the University of Wyoming that is available, as well as the prestigious Case Teacher of the Year Award. So I give you Mark Ritchie. The title of my presentation today is Make 100 of Them, The Contemporary Artist Print in the American West. I decided to tie my studio practice. I'm a maker, not a scholar. And so I wanted to tie my studio practice to the tradition as it's here. And I think there'll be times I, I'm a little like the, uh, the uh, father in my big fat Greek wedding where everything goes back to Greece. A lot of things are going to come back to printmaking in my talk. Um, I grew up in Kansas. I'm a first-generation university student. I'm from a blue-collar background with farming roots, and I think that that has a lot to do with the media that I selected. And if anybody was in band, you probably remember there was the quiet girl that played flute. There was the loud, brash boy that played trumpet. Um, I think we, we pick different disciplines, sometimes because of who we are and what's important to us. So printmaking, for me, became something that uh, was important for a number of reasons I'll go through here. But as an art student, you're not supposed to like the American regionalists. But growing up in the Midwest with lots of murals from the WPA project around, um, having experience with comic books, with uh, the things that we don't call art per se, um, this, was, this was my art, having art that was populist art. And I thought when I went to university that I was going to be a medical illustrator. So I started out coming from a blue collar background, that kind of pragmatic approach to education was important. So someplace in Cadaver Lab, I had sort of the, the, like the ideal storm. I had the Cadaver Lab drawing class. I was making lithographs, and we'll talk about lithography in a minute, but it's a very drawing-based print process. I realized I was making images about who those cadavers were, the people they were, not about um, the illustration. And so when I, when I landed in printmaking and said, I'm really committed to being here, it's drawing-based, it allows me to do what I want to do, I was very excited when I found Vesalius in the 16th century making medical illustrations with print. So it, it's still this kind of scientific approach to making art was there. So I found that they're not so far apart. 
some of the WPA people that influenced me and that are definitely part of an American printmaking tradition and may be familiar to you, um, Benton, Curry, Wood, those are, that's like the trifecta of that group, the WPA project um, and the, or the American regionalists. Benton spoke to a place I recognized, true with Curry as well. It's a certain kind of romantic approach there's also something about all of these in their making that's important. These were on paper, they were made in large editions, they were made to be accessible to lots of people. So not only did I see my family, my community presented in a really heroic, dramatic way, I also saw um, the fact that these were made for those people, which was exciting. So that helped me land in printmaking as a discipline. And that, that history of the print being accessible goes back to, uh, Early, early Renaissance, late medieval prints that were, um, well, for Durer and for art history people, if there's anybody who hasn't had an art history class and may have one, you can cheat. Up in the top, you'll find uh, uh, AD, and sometimes you find the date in here. We'll see it with the, the, a print later, too. Durer was working in the early 16th century and making prints. Um, he was a painter and a printmaker, but making prints so they were accessible to many people. He both reflected social change that was happening at the time. Um, a rising middle class, a shift from the church to uh, a humanist approach, thinking about art being available to everybody, but having these religious items with you. There was also a shift in talking about space, and within Durer's lifetime, he's associated with the Protestant Reformation. Or if we think of what, a little over 100 years later and we look at Rembrandt, we find printmaking both impacted by social change in the, ne the Netherlands and Northern Europe, uh, we also find him affecting change. He's an artist that wasn't just working with a studio of people helping him. He was actually touching the plates and working with them and would make um, shifts from plate to plate just in how he wiped them. So we see printmaking not just becoming a way to disseminate ideas, but a way that he's, he's really thinking of the media, the, the idea and the process coming together. Uh, we also see a shift in, in imagery. So with, with uh, all of our northern European folks in the 17th century, we'll find religious subject matter, but we'll also find landscapes. So it's the beginning of thinking of uh, other, other subject matter being fitting for, for artwork. So what used to be the background now has become the foreground. And, and so a lot of the work that you'll see later in the tour, definitely some of our 19th century work and 20, early 20th century work that's focused on land and how we fit into the landscape certainly come from uh, these northern European artists. And this print's like this big, so it's very strange to see it blown up this big. Hogarth in the 19th century was also making prints for everybody, but in his case, they were serial images. It was a soap opera, one you would subscribe to. The two print series that he's most well known for, The Rake's Progress and Marriage a la Mode, this is from The Rake's Progress, and these are, these are slightly bigger. And if you were uh, purchasing this at the time, you would subscribe and you would receive a print roughly, I think it was every three weeks, something like that, you would receive one of these prints. So you would get the story, it's kind of like Downton Abbey, you know, you get it over a uh, season. <laughs> if we look at Francisco Goya in the, in the um, 18th century, late 18th, early 19th century, um, he was both a court painter, so he was working for the establishment, but at the same time, used printmaking as a way to kind of overthrow the government. He had a couple series, uh, The Disasters of War and Los Caprichos. Uh, the Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters is from Los Caprichos. He was, again, both commenting on uh, the state of the world that he was living in, but also fomenting change. And these went through several editions. So he would make an edition of 50, those would sell. He would make another edition. These are very small. So the word print is really confusing. The brochures you have in your hand are printed. We have lots of printed matter. Um, there are things that are called prints that are images that maybe many of you own, limited edition prints. Limited edition prints are reproductions of existing artwork that are simply printed by a commercial printer in smaller numbers. So you're looking at a limited edition print of George O'Keefe's work that I just pulled from a poster site online. So I want to establish that what I'm doing is something a little different. They go by different names. Um, artist prints, hand-pulled prints, 
they have the potential to be produced in additions. And so in this case, uh, this is Cerise Baden, a visiting artist in the shop, and you can see an edition of prints in front of her, quite large edition that she made with um, student assistants. Printmaking has, uh, what, a history and labor. And even at the university, I show up to meetings a lot like this, but maybe a little ink on me. Um, and so I maybe have a lot more in common with the ad guys that are coming from the, you know, the barn. Uh, because I'm, I am laboring, I'm, and I'm attracted to that. That's part of the reason I think I landed in printmaking. It has a workshop history. So even within the art world, that division between fine art and craft, between a utilitarian purpose, um, there's a utilitarian past, a production past and present with printmaking. So this is an 18th century printmaking workshop. And from our Toppen Rare Book Collection, um, there's a book that I really like. It's a, a primer for teenage boys and girls. This was one designed for boys that have potential jobs, trades that you might go into. So I just photographed some of the trades that are related to printmaking, whether it's calico, textile printing in the bottom, uh, we have a copper plate engraver, we have a printer, a copper plate printer, a letterpress printer, um, a typesetter, I believe. So these professions that were related to the the industry of printmaking in the 19th century. So even now, there's a crossover between what we call graphic design and what we call printmaking, the, the kind of fine art in now. There's also something that in the collection here, you'll see a lot of prints that are done collaboratively. Um, there are major collaborative houses, Tamarind, Gemini, Landfall, um, a number of presses that invite people, and some of them are associated with universities, uh, some of them are associated with commercial galleries. But there's a master printer. So on, this is an image from Tamarind. We have Jim Dine, the artist, standing in the background. We have the master printer here, and then we have a, an apprentice here that's learning. So the separation between the conceptual and the technical um, still takes place, that workshop system that produces larger editions of prints. And in this case, you may have an artist come in who, who really knows little about printmaking, and it's the master printer's job to tell them what can this do and how might you use it. The most base sort of uh, collaboration is not really collaboration at all, is we're gonna make a lot of pot boilers. We're just gonna make a lot of these things. So that's the, the part of printmaking history that maybe gives the art a bad name. But in this case, you have Jim Dine, who really does use, especially lithography, um, with the master printer, is going to make really beautiful work. He's going to handle the crafting end. I work with printmakers. I'm helping students to have both the conceptual and the technical in that one student body um, and head, hopefully. Head and hands working together. Printmaking is defined by having a matrix. And so matrix comes from the Latin for womb. So if you think of the, the block, the plate, the screen, the stone, whatever we're using to make the plate as, as mom, she could have triplets, she could have quadruplets, she might have children from different fathers, so they may be very different. So we, we can have a whole edition that's exactly the same. We might have an edition and then have another one that's inked up differently. Maybe the block has changed. So I want to introduce you to some kind of the core, the foundation of uh, that family of printmaking matrices. And so here is a, a wood block. And so with wood cuts or relief prints, relief prints the bigger family. Wood cuts are the older, uh, one of the oldest forms of printmaking. Probably hand prints and footprints predated. But here you're carving away everything you don't want to print. Wood's a traditional material. Um, in the 20th century, you see linoleum being added after World War II, which allowed for bigger prints, less character, you know, having to deal with the, the wood grain. A close-up of the wood block or a wood block, so you can see what, what's raised in this case is going to print. Woodcuts or relief prints predate paper, so we're going to find printmaking um, being an important way to communicate, to disperse images to lots of people inexpensively after we have paper making entering uh, Europe from Asia. Before that, we do see woodcuts being used with textile printing, and these are some students in India we do textile workshops while we're there with students in a commercial textile facility that's still doing hand printing. This is another dirt. There's our little cheat up there for everybody, CWC students taking art history right up there. The dirt and the 1510, so you got your date. 
This is uh, expulsion from the garden, Albrecht Durer. So just looking at those, those kind of the high point of woodcuts in Western history, it's going to happen right at the beginning of the Renaissance. And we're going to find woodcuts still used in the 19th century as illustration, but a little more crudely. This is a book from, both of these are from the Toppen Library at the, at the uh, UW, um, which is associated with the American Heritage Center. And this, this is a chat book, so a book um, for, for children. And the woodcut's a little, it's very small. The woodcut's a little crude. Um, we find in the early part of the 20th century, German expressionist printmakers going back and looking at a woodcut tradition, even though they had many other potential printmaking processes available to them. There's also an Eastern history. And about the 18th century is where we see sort of the high point of that Eastern history of uh, woodcut, uh, making relief prints, water-based work, again, printed in a workshop, printed for mass consumption, similar sort of historical social changes creating a world where, where everybody can have quasi-disposable art. This is from a current exhibition, and it's all whopper jawed because I sort of did the bad thing at the museum. Jane didn't hear that, and took a photo without a flash um, so that you could see what's currently at the, this is in the teaching gallery at the museum. Intaglio prints print what's below the surface, and so this is a close-up of one of my plates. I tried to get close so you could sort of see the incisions. Um, intaglio processes are family. They mean below the surface, we have engraving, etching. Within etching, there's a number of ways that you can put grounds on a plate so that your uh, bite with a caustic solution creates a different kind of bite. So in this plate, you can see those hard lines. Those are etched lines. And so I'm just scratching through uh, it's asphalt wax, a solution that's on the surface that's uh, a film, a waxy film that I can draw through. So we see Rembrandt's work, those really fluid marks or etched marks. Goya introduced Aquatint. So if you look at that kind of speckled surface, the ground's not even. It's just a dusting of rosin that's heated on the plate, so the acid bites where the rosin isn't. So depending on how long you leave it in the acid, you can get grays, blacks, um, a whole range of values. I teach in a space that's perfect for the dyslexic. Everything we do is backwards. So whatever they're putting on the plate is going to print backwards. So you're seeing a proof in the background Everybody knows intaglio processes. Your dollar bill is engraved. All your money is engraved. So an uh, image in the studio, a student wiping a plate. So you're putting ink over the whole surface. And this is a um, 17th century um, image, about this big, from a book in the top in the library. So you can see the types of lines. With just etching, you're, you're describing value through cross-contour marks. It's very related to drawing and the, the thickness, the thinness, um, contour edges, where lines stop and start help create those spaces. This is from a De Vries. This is a treasure in the top and library. I think I have a detail. These are um, early exploration images, and these are um, 17th century, mid-17th century um, books with heavily illustrated with, and these pages fold out. So the, the book's about this big, and then the, the illustrations fold out of it. But again, the combination of etching and engraving. At this point, you see the fluidity of etching creating a lot of these marks, but then coming back in with an engraving tool. The engraving tool goes into the metal, nice pointed edge, pops back out, nice pointed edge. So it makes a very sharp image, but it also there's a resistance, so they're very mechanical. Again, look at your dollar, and you'll see there's a certain kind of mechanical way of because there's that resistance with the metal. So in this case, using the best of what both of those intaglio processes have to offer. Lithography is a process that we have a date for, 1796, and we have a, a whole kind of mythic history. Aloysius Senefelder, a bad playwright, um, writes on a stone table, this is Bavarian limestone, and spills wine on it. The acidity of the wine kind of chewed up the stone, but where the wax pencil he wrote on the table was left in relief. And so he thought he'd found a new process, and he had, but he thought he'd found a new relief process. He had found a planographic process. This is all chemical. We had relief that was raised, intaglio that's in size. So we're wiping ink into the surface and wiping off the top. In this case, there's no change at all, which students refer to this as black magic. It's all chemistry. My biochemistry undergraduate roommate said, this is great. And he would build me chemical models of this that I don't understand. But I do understand that we're changing the pH of the stone when we're drawing on it. So we're creating 
Here we go. There we are. There's a stone in my studio. So I'm making a drawing using grease-based materials and then treating the stone so that those areas where the drawing was placed will accept grease and the other areas will accept water. So the stone's hydrophilic and oleophilic and we're controlling it through changing the pH of the stone. And the stone, you can work back into it. The beauty of it is you can subtract things, you can add things, and it has a real range of, of marks it can make. It can imitate uh, or work with sort of drawn marks. It can also work with painted marks. So tamarind that we saw earlier loves lithography because it has the ability uh, to have somebody who maybe knows very little about the process come in but feel familiar with those drawing materials. And Francisco Goya, this was a process, again, related to industry. If you look at the 19th century, this was a major commercial printmaking process or printing process um, in the 19th century that then made it a little suspect for artists to use. So it wasn't until Goya, as an old man in the 1820s, picked it up and made his um, Bulls of Bordeaux series that uh, it sort of gained some cachet. It was okay. If Goya would do it, then, then it must be all right. And so we see artists using it at the same time it's being used for industrial purposes. Um, but by the time you get to the early 20th century, this is going to be what the WPA artists, again, artists may be coming from painting and drawing traditions who are being paid to make art, would go to the printmaking studios and could make many images using this that sort of related back to their drawings and paintings. Yet they have really, lithographs have these unique properties. Lithography is sort of my first love, so I, I tend to be a little biased. Our last process is silkscreen. And so screen has definitely an industrial textile printing tradition, um, also a poster making tradition. This is Melanie Yazzie. She teaches in Boulder. This is at a conference that just happened a couple weeks ago with a couple of my students. And a nice example that has something to do with where we are, um, commercial posters that were printed using silkscreen, multiple colors being layered up to make this. So each one having its own screen. There's registration. So you're, how do these line up that become part of this when you're working with color? How are the colors set on top of each other? You can print anything, even a fish. We were having a conversation. This came up independently. I didn't even bring it up last night. Um, a student using a Japanese tradition of printing fish. We made her um, put those back in the freezer when she was done. <laughs> you can also print with things that are not oppressed. When we were moving from our old building, this is where I taught for 16 years, back in the old married student housing. And it was both horrible and wonderful. Um, but when they moved the presses for a little while, I was still teaching, but didn't have the tools I needed to teach. So we rented a steamroller and printed <laughs> big woodcuts um, in the parking lot. So it was a chance to, to work in a different way and think a little differently. But generally, we're using presses. And so this is a litho press. This is in the shop too, um, a litho press. And a litho press has a bar that comes down on the stone. This is an intaglio press. So the intaglio press uses a roll. And this is, this is a monster of a press. We have one of a handful of oversized American French tool presses. When we moved to the new building, I had wants and needs. And I only had really one big want, and it was this. And it was a big one. Um, so this is, this is a wonderful thing that we have in the state. This is where it gets confusing. In the 19th century, printmaking or uh, photography killed painting, but it didn't really kill it, but it did sort of revise it. It gave painting a very specific new job. It was no longer about documentation. It was about paint and what paint could do. And suddenly, it, it threw us into uh, modernism. And so when we look at what digital tools can do and you know, the, the need for printmaking to be a way to create uh, multiples, is less important. So we're finding that artists are using the digital tool as a way to start an image, transfer something, make photographic plates. So it definitely has been integrated, in, integrated into the family of printmaking, even though we don't have that direct contact with the matrix. In this case, like photography, another indirect process, a negative or a positive that's somehow creating the plate. We have those matrices that are indirect. I'm not touching the, the paper with the print. I'm working with a block that then makes this. This has that similarity. And so we have artists who are using the digital tools to make work that definitely is part of a printmaking discussion in history. Um, we have people who are using, this is Sima Katz's work, a triptych. These are about this big. And they're primarily digital. I think there's some lithographic um, layers in there, but most of the layers are done using 
uh, digital printers. When with the students, they're really uncomfortable with this. It's a great discussion, but it's part of the contemporary discussion of what's a print. That issue of uh, the matrix making children by multiple parents, um, that's really where printmaking is right now. How do you make variables? How do you take that matrix and change how you manipulate it or how it gets layered up? This is a student's work from a couple years ago. I'm a visiting artist, uh, Melissa Havland. She teaches in Ohio, and she came and made an installation uh, with the students assisting her of cut out teacups. And the teacups were all printed differently so that you might have the same shape teacup, but different things printed on it, or words printed on these as well. And so you end up using, or she used, printmaking's ability to make variables, to make something that's now coined a print installation. You have lots of print artists making installations with prints, using that ability to make multiples. Um, the artist Swoon, a contemporary artist who's going back to that, that core of printmaking, art for everybody, uh, the idea that maybe you can't buy it or sell it. And she prints relief prints, large-scale relief prints, on um, newsprint, so it's, it's ephemeral, and they get put up in places, and frequently they celebrate communities. This is in Philadelphia um, with a printmaking conference, and they were all over a really rough neighborhood. So on a Saturday, Sunday morning, I guess, I went out with students, and we found all of Swoon's work on walls. She's kind of worshipped by uh, my students. Not my students, but students generation. They love this idea of having something that's both physical and hand printed, accessible, and not about being commercial. And so they brought some of those ideas home, and things happened on campus that I had to look the other way on. Um, fortunately, this was on a, a trash can, and it comes off. It's wheat pasted on there, so. That tradition of um, graphic design and printmaking coming together, we can find it in book history. So if we look at you know, an Italio image, and all the text is relief printed. So if we go back to the 16th century, the beginning of all those prints being disseminated was the same time we saw commercial presses printing words, and uh, an increased literacy happening in the early 16th century. In about 50 years, we, we I think, tripled literacy in Northern Europe. And so this history of typesetting being part of that. And so we have a letterpress space in the print shop. And last year, a donation from Ucross of type um, doubled our letterpress studio, which was wonderful. And here is another My Big Fat Greek Wedding moment. Um, this may be true or not true, but the mythic story relates to Wyoming. You have a drawer that has uppercase letters, big letters, uppercase, and then you have the little letters in the lowercase. You're traveling west, you have all this weight. If you've ever picked up a drawer, you know how heavy those are. When you get to South Pass, what happens? You need to shed some weight. So the drawers were consolidated there, in theory. Maybe it didn't happen there. But the drawer became called a California job case. It consolidated uppercase and lowercase letters. So I thought that was a nice one to throw in for this one. Um, from our collection at the Toppen Library, Barry Moser, contemporary illustrator, working in a fine press book tradition. So he's not making new text, but using canonical text, like well, Moby Dick in this case. And we just had a donation of a Bible. And this was an illustrated Bible. It's beautiful. So if you come through, you've got to see that one. But he's a wood engraver who's working with resin graph. So he's, rather than using wood, it's wood engraving tradition um, with uh, basically PVC. So it allows him to make bigger illustrations. And I think I have a detail. So this is about that craft. This is more in that printer tradition um, about making something that's beautifully produced. It's handmade paper. I mean, this is just exquisite. Jumping a little. We live in a beautiful place. And a lot of it's been preserved. And part of that preservation is because of folks like Baird, Stat, and Moran. So behind me, and when we're done, um, you can come up and from here take a look at the Moran that's loaned from the National Park Service, um, Tetons with Snow, and then Buffalo Hunt, Baird, Stat. And I wanted to see if we had something from the collection that could be pulled. So it's great to pull in the, the museum here. This is from the UW collection. This is a Beardstadt engraving that's about this big. And so um, Beardstadt was part of the Hudson uh, School, and, but part of the Rocky Mountain School. Some of the artists ended up coming west and taking the same ideas of man and nature, man being small, nature being grand, and part of that romantic movement 
um, of the, the 19th century. And he came to the West uh, two different times, three different times, 1850s, 1860s, the first time with the surveying crew with Frederick Lander, and next time with Hugh Ludlow, and went back to his studio in the East. So he dropped in, made some work, but went back to the East and then talked about that with a large painting, and then made um, prints that were widely distributed. So again, we see prints taking um, those ideas to the masses and really helped preserve a lot of our public spaces. It shaped public opinion about the West and that it wasn't wilderness or wild space or bad lands, but there somehow was something worth keeping. Um, and there was a, rom uh, a romantic and religious element to that as well, and that's Paul's world, so I'll let him talk about that someday. Um, in Laramie, in that neighborhood, we have Moran passing through in the Laramie Plains. The Red Buttes just south of town recording. I like to show these to students. It helps link them to a, an, a history of other artists who have made work about their place. And of course, it's a little, little dramatic. We made it a little bigger, a little more grand than, than maybe it looks every day, although it's pretty grand. And these are small images. So similarly, uh, Moran helped shape public opinion um, and with, with his image of Yellowstone in 1872 helped create uh, the park as well. Again, living in a beautiful place, a dramatic place, and building on those traditions that came before us of making images about the West, how do you do that when your space has been subverted, when it's become an icon? Uh, the West is America. And I, I tell students that it's the Marlboro Man syndrome. How do we deal with that as visual artists? And it's a tricky job. And so I'm going to show you some artists in the West. Florence McEwen's the first one I'm going to stop on. She is at Rock Springs. She teaches at Central or at Western Wyoming, and she's handled it by not talking about the West at all. So she lives here and somehow avoids it. She talks about issues of gender. She is working with appropriated images and intaglio prints superimposed over those, um, and looking at fairy tales, the idea of Red Riding Hood, and Red Riding Hood becomes quite powerful. In combination intaglio prints, um, doing some uh, digital work with these as well, to bring those appropriate images back to the printmaking, controlling where they sit in the image and how they sit there. <laughs> I think the title of this, this one's Hang That Man Out to Dry. <laughs> Sue Summers is a rancher that lives in Pinedale, and I only have a couple of her images, unfortunately. She works with artist books, sort of a, a tangential relationship to uh, printmaking, making prints, but then placing them in artist books. She also makes some really beautiful etchings of her husband, Albert, doing things like moving hay bales and things. Nate Abel is in um, Casper. He's a UW alum who went to graduate school in uh, Arizona, and he speaks to the openness of the space. These become metaphors for relationships with family, um, personal histories. And these are combinations of lithography and intaglio. Along with uh, an artist friend in Casper, he started a letterpress studio. So his, he's earning his living as a graphic designer. And then he's finding the space between printmaking and graphic design through doing custom letterpress work. Cerise Baden is a teacher in Tucson at um, AU, University of Arizona, U of A. And I'm going to read her words. Um, her statement was so right on, I want to honor her words. Rural before urban, land forms over cityscapes, wild instead of domestic. It's the land and how we do or do not use it that consistently draws my focus. Having long made art whose concepts stem from an upbringing in a remote part of rural Idaho, my connection to isolation, land, land use, and self-definition in the context of the American West have always been strong. Printmaking is a process that allows me to work through concepts with endless visual permutations. Experimenting with multiple plates, inking techniques, or modules provide more freedom from the fixed singular image. So in this case, you're seeing two small plates that are placed together to print. Sometimes she reuses these or alters them and prints them in different combinations. So a couple more of Cerise's work.
Nyla is a shared student between Cerise and I. Nyla's currently finishing her MFA um, in Arizona, and these are very small works. She is originally from Cody, and I, I know that she, I can tell that she lived in the shadow of the BBHC, and it has a new name. Um, but her works are about sort of rethinking Western stories, and that story of European and Native American contact being a major part of that. So ledger drawings uh, become part of her, her, her historical source. Sukha Warb is in um, Bozeman. And the matrix becomes part of his work. He draws with a router on um, the insulation foam, that pink and blue foam, takes rubber and stretches across that, peels the rubber off, and makes rubber stamps. And each of these rubber stamps are about this big. You'll see them here in a minute. But those are exhibited in, in the exhibition space, and he's actually printing on the wall. So he's making something that's an extension of drawing, this place between drawing and printmaking, where the process becomes evident as he's working. He also invites, in some of the work, the viewer to contribute to the drawing. So he lays down some kind of base, and people continue to work within it. He also takes these and works on paper, so he makes images that are uh, that can be saved. But the ones on the wall, of course, can't be bought or sold. They can only be experienced. Kathy Pusey is in Logan, Utah. And Kathy's finding a world between the 2D and 3D in her most recent work. I was sort of surprised when she sent these. A lot of the work's been two-dimensional, dealing with the same ideas. She's been mounting paper to wood. But what you're looking at are two-by-twos, so lumber, commercial lumber, that she's carved. She's made woodcuts looking at sticks and um, bark, and then she's adhered those to the sticks. So it asks questions about real and processed, between natural and, and processed. I won't say unnatural in this case, but, um, and again, I'm going to read her words. Her words are wonderful for where this comes from. My work stems from a long and active relationship with my surroundings. Having spent many years in a small mountainous town in northern Utah, a deep love and fascination grew for this easily accessible wilderness. This essential relationship goes beyond that of mere spectator. Upon further inspection, I find myself in a state of dueling contradiction, one of utmost humble respect and the other consisting of an urgency to impose, inspect, and rearrange. We as humans have a need to control, manipulate, and make things more readily accessible. Where and when does it end? What do we sacrifice in the process? Somewhere in between this internal tug of war, war is where my fascination and inspiration lies. Um, and Gazania Jansen is also in Bozeman. And she makes much more traditional works. But like the, the 19th century artists that came before, she's speaking to the landscape. Um, this one's entitled Omaha. She's exploring the Missouri River. and. Um, this one, waterway, but she has the hand of man in there, but not as something alien and bad, but definitely something that's altered the landscape. So we see power lines, um, we see bridges. These are woodcuts, relief prints. And I thought I would end with, with my work. Um, my, my work has been, had a lot of animal imagery um, for a long time, uh, metaphorical sort of use of, of birds and rabbits and monkeys and dogs. And my midlife crisis was a Mustang. And when I told people, I was like, what kind of Mustang did you get? It's like, it, it's black. But the he kind of clued people in that we had something else going on here. So learning about an animal that has a wild history, but now we're working together and he's domesticated, maybe, um, has been really what my work is about, about wild, domestic, and so this is an artist book about this big, a series of images, I'm showing you one folio spread, that's called uh, Mustang and Cultivar, looking at that idea of where does garden end, where does wild space begin, where does that wildness of this horse I'm getting to know stop and start. And so with, for me, I've been working a lot with lithography, and these images are roughly this big. And um, going in the field, making drawings, bringing a lot like Moran and Bairdstadt, bringing those back to the studio and continuing to work, distilling that meaning in the studio, taking that matrix and putting it together 
with others. So you know, you had the same image on the left, the same stone creating that, but in different combinations. So it creates a very different kind of composition and frequently a different context in meaning. And this was the horse that was in the background on the other one. Also looking at relationships of horses, how does communication, it's a continuation of work that was about communication, but it's a different kind of communication now. It's not just between the communication we have as people between each other sort of uh, put onto animals, but also what that animal communication is between the horses. I like the fluidity of lithography, my ability to work and rework the images to go out in the field and work, to bring it back in and transfer them. And in, those, in that process, printmakers are process heads, like photographers. We can get <coughs> caught there. I like not the product necessarily, but just the act of making and changing things. I have to remember to periodically pull a print. Also, I'm fascinated by paper, a love of paper. And so I allow that paper to still be evident. And that's part of that Asian aesthetic that, that Paul mentioned earlier. These last few are collagraphs, and so this is roughly four by six foot. And so this, this takes me from that Asian miniature tradition I'm looking at to, I don't know, something different, screens. And um, collagraphs are, are creating a surface on the plate that can be inked up in talio, but it's not that tradition of working with metal. So I'm working with masonite, um, putting things down that will hold carborundum, the surface that's on your sandpaper, and then putting varying, varying amounts of acrylic on top of that um, on the plate that will then fill in the space between the sand. So if there's a lot of space, it'll be really black. If there's less space, there'll be light gray. And making these things that are very shaped, mm, very, very much like a, an Asian brush painting in some ways. And I'll end on this one. And I'm proud to belong to a community of artists of the West engaged in exploring issues of place and equally proud to be part of a longer lineage of artists working with printmaking and adding to a dynamic and flexible media. I had to come up with those words to read. Um, <laughs> and also, thank you for letting me share today. It's always nice to talk about uh, my media and the people I like. I also wanted to say thank you to the museum um, for taking care of these. They're currently custodians for the National Park Service of the Moran, and the Beardstadt belongs to them, so I'm really happy they brought this out. They are going to haul them away as soon as we're done here. Um, also, thank you to the Top and Rare Book Library and to the UW Art Museum. Can you talk a little bit about your, your growing up years and your personal background? Yeah. Um, I grew up in Olathe, Kansas. I don't know if anybody familiar with Olathe? Olathe is a suburb of Kansas City, but when I was little, it was uh, a rural county seat. It was 16,000 people. My classmates, a lot of them were in 4-H. So you had kids that were in town and kids that were in the countryside. By the time I left to go away to college, it was over 100,000. So what we're seeing happening on the front range looks really familiar. So the neighborhoods took on the names of the dairies that they replaced. Um, so Growing up in something that's so homogenous America, I didn't think I knew much about anything special. It was, you know, McDonald's and interstate stuff. Um, I studied abroad in Wales and Scotland for a year, and I came back and said, oh, I know a lot. This is a very special place. Um, there are things that are unique about what I've experienced. And I also decided to own my WPA people. You know, it's like, no. Nah. While, while we may kind of not want to talk about them, um, they, there's something valuable there. And so uh, I went to graduate school in Indiana then, and there were a lot of people like me. Although in universities, being a, a first-generation university student, sometimes you feel a little out of the loop. There's a great book, uh, Limbo. I think it came out like a decade ago. And I think reading that as somebody in, in the university system helped me go, oh, I understand why I have to offer this, and I also understand why I sometimes feel awkward I don't always have the cues. So, did that, did that help you? Yeah, but drawing, I was always drawing. Um, but I was also one of those people that was very engaged in science, and I think somehow it was the observation and ways to understand the world through, through fact and, and more empirically um, that were those two. And so that was the, the medical illustration part. But then I realized I really have a love of drawing, and I see it like poetry. It has a job of telling the truth, but maybe in a way that's, that's different. Yeah. You refer 
referred often to um, the craft involved, and you had that example of the book showing different um, works. What are the job markets for, I mean, if, if somebody truly focuses? Usually those people are coming from art backgrounds. So I always tell students, believe in your work, and you'll, who knows where it's going to take you. And those are the people who get so excited. Well, when I was in grad school, I had a, a colleague who was so excited about solving all of our problems, he was never doing his own work. He goes, you know, if you do this, this, and this, this will work. Well, let me just do it. And so he'd take over, and he was over making your work. Um, that's, that's a printer. Um, he didn't really want to be engaged in the conceptual part of doing this. He was the technical problem solver. He went on, he, just, he left grad school and went and trained to be a master printer. He recognized that that's who he was. Although he'd come from a making background, I think you almost need that making experience. There are some places that train, like Tamron has a master printer training program. Um, there are artist studios, usually again, there are young artists working, setting type or uh, learning those things. But then they become old artists who continue doing that. Um, so there's a, a handful that do that. But it's a small, that's a small world. It's a little like the people who are curators. You know, how do you get into that? You can take the art history route, you can take the art route, you can take the museum studies route, but usually only a few people end up truly doing that. And they're usually the people who never planned on doing it in the first place. That's the funny part. Yeah? What took you to India? Oh, a plane. But it was, um, <laughs> But what took me to India? It was, it, was, it was a love of small works on paper. And so I went to Morocco first and um, realized there was an Islamic tradition, but it was hard for me to get there. And so in Morocco, I ended up realizing my bad French was only getting me so far. And I actually had the perfect example in Morocco of what happened. I went back with a language program, studied Darja, the Moroccan uh, Arabic knowing I wasn't going to master it, but I was going to have enough to enter the culture, went back to one of the same bookbinders. One of my instructors said, oh, there's a man you meet, need to meet. He took me to Mr. Wazani's studio, and I pretended like I had never met him before. He pretended like he had never met me before. We worked in a combination of bad French, you know, um, bad Moroccan Arabic, and then translation and some English. And at the very end, he said, it's so good you're learning Arabic. He showed me things that he didn't show me the first time because I had a new entrance. So India became a similar thing where I went to learn a little bit about works on paper, only got so far, went back and learned some Hindi, and now I get much deeper. Um, not because I've mastered Hindi, but because I have just enough Hindi to be dangerous, and it's clear that I want to have that <laughs> cultural introduction. And so, um, but it's, it's works on paper, but then it, it, it blossomed from there to things that I hadn't even dreamed of. And that textile printing thing was something I hadn't really thought about, but meeting uh, people continuing those traditions. And it's a bit of a dying tradition, too, because it can be reproduced so easily in photomechanical ways, people still carving blocks or still printing by hand. Um, it's a small segment. It's a bit of a revival going on. So I just keep going back and keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So, yeah. But I've done artist residencies there that put me in contact with contemporary artists and have me there doing my own work. And then that gives you a, a longer time there to meet, meet those other people and be surprised by what you find. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I noticed under the beer staff in the Moran it said engraving. Yeah. And I just, what, how is that? Under that tablet family? Uh -huh. It uses a tool that's pushing through the metal. And so if you look at armor or you look at some of that early, um, jewelry, you'll see something called a nilo. So you were engraving, you were rubbing a wax in there so you would get a black line. You could draw into the metal. Um, out of that metalsmithing tradition, to take a record of it, you would pull a, pull a proof. And so that's where this intaglio tradition started. So it became like a woodcut, only just reverse. Um, and so the, the printmakers belonged to the metalsmithing guild, the jewelers guild. My wife's a metalsmith too, so it's, I, I belong to the metalsmith guild. Um, that idea of, of, of making uh, works that come from engraving were the first ones, but really mechanical. Etching became a way to put a surface on that plate, just carve through the, or draw through the, the ground on the surface, that exposes the metal, and then you're allowing acid. So etching and engraving are printed in the same way, but the marks are made in different ways. Yeah? Are there lots of students interested these days in a degree 
in art? Yes, we have. Um, when I started teaching at UW, we had 89 undergraduate students. That's an odd number, 89, I remember that. And now we're up to nearly 400. Um, so I think so. But they're there for different reasons. And that's something I remember in the classroom, that some of them are there because they want to continue making art. Some of them are there because this is a place for intellectual inquiry that's mm, presented in a way that makes sense. It's a non-verbal place to explore that. And, but they're at a university where they're putting that scholarly side and the art together. Where if they went to an art school, it'd be more about just making the art. But I, I think there are. But again, lots of reasons to make it. Yeah. I toured your new building at UW. Yes. And that is a very fine facility. It certainly and is. And uh, it helps you. <laughs> yes. Um, we, you know, we thought we might have uh, a lot of growth happen um, after we got the new building. And we really didn't. We had, you know, maybe a few students. But I think the program um, just, we have room to breathe now. Like I said, I was out in the married student housing, so roughly from here to the middle of the, the aisles, but really long. So it was like teaching in a trailer. Um, I didn't know what was happening back there. And now we're in a, a more square building with adequate um, ventilation so everybody's brains and livers are protected. And so I, I like that. So it's, <laughs> it's ventilation, it's light, it's um, space designed for the way students are working now. The other thing I remember that the architects brought up that um, I, wa I wasn't sure we needed this, were lots and lots of plugins coming from the wall or from the ceiling. I said, oh, we don't need all those in the print shop. They said, well, we're putting them there anyway. And it's the best thing. Um, it's wonderful. It allows the space to be really fluid. And students are using it in ways that I wouldn't have thought about using it. It makes sense for them. So, yeah. What is lithography? Lithography translates to stone writing. And so the limestone that you saw, um, that's the oldest way to make lithographs, although there are lots of, uh, well, aluminum plates or what are used for offset lithography. Artists ended up using those. Now there's even um, Teflon plates and um, polymer plates, different kinds of plates that you can make lithographs on that behave the same way as the stone. The advantage of that stone is it's like skin. It has a memory. So the, the grease is going in the stone, so I can change things. I can't do that on the plate, but the plates allow for photographic processes to be integrated. Printmaking can be very drawing-based or very photo-based, but lithography um, is dealing with oil and water not mixing. That's the simplest way to explain it. And so the stone has both oil-loving and water-loving properties. And Paul's saying it's time to stop. One quick question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your best day, where you got it? Yeah, yeah. My, son, my son's a horseback archer. And we started when he was like this big, he wanted to do this. And it's like, where's this coming from? He's adopted in Korean, and we swear that it's coming from Korea with him. Um, <laughs> although he's only this big when we got him. Um, but he, he had a horse that he was working with in a paddock um, that there was this horse I just liked. And so I asked about leasing the horse. And again, I don't have a. Uh, background with horses. That was a midlife thing. Um, so I'm a very cautious writer. Um, but I asked about Domingo, started working with him, and uh, his owner is in her 80s, and he was just in a lot of horses. There was a mare she wanted. She got a couple other horses. She didn't want them to be dog food, so they've just been lawn ornaments since then. And so I asked about him, and she said, no, no, I'd never sell. And I leased him for about a year and a half, two years at that point. She said, I could never sell Domingo, but if you promise to take care of him for the rest of his life, there's no such thing as a free horse, I'll give him to you. And so, so she pawned that Mustang off on me, but we're both really happy. Yeah.